So listen. You're on the cover of next month's Flux. You owe me an interview, remember? You maul a semi-famous rock star and literally try to eat her face off. So what's your point? Everybody who's anybody knows it happened, yet nobody's got the story. I want this, and when I want something, I don't stop until I get it. Julia, I need you to leave. 911, what's your emergency? Julia? What happened? You happened! You can't have her. Stay back! Devin. You hearing me? Wonderful. Then we'll keep this really simple to start with. Uh, Lene Alice, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It is an absolute pleasure. How are you doing today? Um, pretty good. Uh, we just had a private screening of the film last night, so I think we're feeling pretty fresh. Yeah. Definitely. I think we're still on that high. <laughs> Yes, of course, I did speak to your director uh, shortly before we actually doing this interview as well. And you did mention the fact that you have now seen the full thing. So I have to follow up with that then. Alice, uh, what did you think overall seeing it in the uh, fully done? Yeah, it was it was really great. The um, the the excitement and the build up and watching the preview. Um, I was not prepared for the climax of this scene. So I think seeing that was the most exciting because um, I remember recording it. It was like um, five, five, six a.m. in the morning and we were all really tired. And it's just great to see all of all of that, um, all of that work and that morning energy um, looks so real on film. <laughs> How about you, Lene? Um. Gosh, so um, I was probably one of the only ones besides the director, Matt Pacman, that had seen it several other times before we all got <laughs> together to see it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, with a bunch of adults, it's hard to uh, get your schedules together. So once we knew we had a finished product and we wanted to get together, it was like going to be months away. So <laughs> after we had all decided on a date to get together to see it, I was like, I'm going to have to look at that before. <laughs> like, I cannot wait. Um, any longer and honestly I think a little bit of it was because working with him on you know the movie before this morbid colors I was just really anxious to see you know that that next chapter uh for Devin even though I was there I just I needed to see it so <laughs> yeah of course you uh, both come from de very different directions into this show we'll get a little bit more into that later on but for now I want to keep it really based upon you both individually and starting with you, Alice, how has 2023 been for you overall? Have you been able to keep yourself particularly busy? Of course, we are following a period where effectively, thanks to a uh, worldwide pandemic and so on, where opportunities and work was no doubt limited and different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I've been pretty busy. Um, during the pandemic, I picked up this uh, jobby uh, side hustle of narrating audiobooks. So I've still been able to perform while being remote. Um, so I feel like I've been doing a lot of that this year. Um, but um, when Matt approached me about this script, um, I hadn't been on a film or on stage um, physically in a long time. So I was like, yes, I, I'd be really excited to, to do this. And um, I think ever since then, um, I've done a couple of other uh, stage shows um, and, and my own works um, getting staged. So yeah, been pretty busy. <laughs> How about you, Lenny? Um, Gosh, 2023 just kind of uh, was a little bit hectic for me. I quit my job that I've had for like 10 years um, as a preschool teacher and just kind of went in a completely different direction uh, with my career. I work at the health department. <laughs> I do um, like vital records. So I'm issuing like birth certificates and death certificates. Um, I love the, the morbid side of that, um, honestly. Uh, but other than that, it's just kind of going with the flow uh, COVID was really, really hard, uh, 
just to kind of get back into the the swing of things. So I'm kind of excited to see what the the new year has, the fresh start on everything. I think everybody kind of needs a little bit of that every once in a while. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. It's, it's awesome to hear that you are both keeping so busy in your personal lives as much as anything else, particularly as we, you know, we have this excellent new horror short real called Time coming, well, hopefully coming out, being available for general viewership over the next year. But before that, I want to hear a little bit about yourselves, really, in particular, how you got started in the business of movie making, how you kind of first found your feet. To start with you, Alice, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us a little bit of background. Sure. Um, I remember taking my first screenwriting class in junior year of college. And I guess that's when I first started um, writing, at least maybe not filmmaking or acting for film necessarily. Mm. Um, but yeah, so it was back in college, like 2005, 2006. Um, and then I got more into theater, actually. And then when I moved to Evansville about 13 years ago, got involved in the theater community there. And I think it was in um, one of the shows I did in maybe like 2018 that Matt saw me and thought and um in that show I was portraying kind of a a brash character so I think he saw that and was like oh yeah maybe I want that energy for my film um so yeah I think yeah in the time that I've lived in Evansville have done a lot of theater been in a couple of short films or small roles um and was was really glad that Matt um asked asked me to be part of this universe mm because there is so much more into this universe that he's planning. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed, yes. Uh, we did try to dance around a lot of that in uh, the interview with Matthew, um, because obviously we don't want to give away too much what goes forward. Um, Lynette, how about you? Uh, your kind of early days and what kind of got you interested in film, being in films? Um, I've always really been into like movies and acting. Um, I did like theater stuff in high school and that kind of bled into uh, like, my early 20s doing like community theater. Um, I got started in film with, uh, you know, the previous film with Matt. Um, he had worked on something with um, my friend, Kara Gray, who was in Morbid Colors and she has a, a little bit of a part in Real Cool Time. Uh, they had gotten together on a project that just didn't happen. And then when he thought of uh, Morbid Colors, he kind of had Kara in mind and she just kind of brought me on board with that. Um, and then we just thought there was a little bit more to um, the story and Matt decided he was going to write something else and uh, was like, you got to come back. We got to do it. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, he's just really given me a really great like opportunity. So I'm just on this train with him until he stops it or kicks me off. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to you then, Alice. What has been one of the more challenging aspects of uh, creating a career in film for you? Um, I guess I think during the during the pandemic, we kind of saw how art had to be remade. Mm. Um, so yeah, as as um, a, a playwright and a narrator and a, and a film actor, I think we've had to do a lot more um, creating of short form art, like on on TikTok and social media. Um, and then when auditioning for um, for work, you have to self tape and you have to create your own studio, like in your own home to do things. So it's mm. kind of like relearning. Um, uh, relearning how to position yourself for like a zoom frame and not just using your whole body if you were uh, auditioning in person. So I feel like uh, yeah, adapting, adapting to that in these past couple of years was a difficulty. You, you almost make it sound quite easy the way you just threw and went through all these different elements that a lot of people in a lot of different industries, whether it be from filmmaking to music and so on, really, really struggle, particularly in the first six to 12 months. Did, did you find yourself adapting quite quickly to those changes? And then what were you able to take what you learned from that into now? Um, I think I had a couple of good mentors I, during the during the pandemic. Um, so uh, ushering my, ushering ushering my way in um, was okay, and I feel like I didn't have too many grand goals. So when I got a little nibble, I was happy with it, and, <laughs> and that kept me boosted for other auditions. Um, so um, 
maybe maybe the advice that I that I take from myself now is to keep manageable goals and not to not to necessarily shoot for the stars, but keep manageable goals because when when you meet them, you you get that nice hit of serotonin, but then it still keeps you moving forward. <laughs> Instead of I like that. you don't get that goal. <laughs> yeah, realistic. Be realistic. Mm-hmm. What about you, Lene? What's been one of the more challenging aspects of um, creating and being in films to date for you? I mean, I kind of got to, you know, second what Alice said. It's all about just adapting to the process. And, you know, we had you and I say you as like, you know, collectively as, you know, Mm. an actor who gets so used to doing things like a certain way. And then when that happened, it's just like okay, like, how am I going to do this? Like the things that Alice said, like, how am I going to create a space that's going to be, you know, good enough to audition quality wise? Like, how am I going to, without having the big space to audition in, how am I going to be more in the frame and like try to, I mean, sorry to repeat myself, but it was just really all about adapting to it. And, you know, as much as that sucks, you just got to do what you got to do to create the, the art and be a part of art and I just think that really helped me get through COVID was just kind of still having that link to people and still being able to create art even though it was like very like a constrictive way to do it. Considering it obviously was such an inherently and still is such an inherently negative uh, period of time are you able to reflect on that adaptability and what you learn in a more positive way and say hey at least I learned something at least I was able to take things from it definitely I think um just learning to do something that's so familiar to you in a completely new way um that kind of you can use that not only with acting but with all different kinds of you know troubles that you come across in your life it's just like okay I this is a situation I'm familiar with I can't solve it in a way that Mm. I'm familiar with so here's this new way to deal with it I guess well, flipping it around then into something more positive, now we talked about the challenges of uh, making movies and being in films and so on. What about the most rewarding aspects that you found to date that you have enjoyed? Starting with you, Alice, what's been something or that you can look at and say, you know what, that's been particularly rewarding for me? Um, I think getting a network of people. Mm. Um yeah, it's like you see, I know that Jake, the the cinematographer on this film, he has a full length feature that he's working on as well. And I have a small part in that. And then um, someone else recently asked me to audition for this. And there are, you know, other people that I know from that film. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's just kind of cool seeing what everybody is working on and how we dip into each other's wells of knowledge to um to create new art so yeah having that having that community i think what about you lena that's definitely um something i can relate with too is just having that little group that just kind of you know if you work together during that period of time it just kind of made you closer so that you know that helps you network that helps you get like your little family together and that was just something that i think is a really positive thing that can come out of something so terrible is just that closeness that you get with people just by working together and creating art together. Oh, it's incredible to hear. So real cool time. This of course mm-hmm. is the new high shot we are here to talk about. It summed up quite nicely with the IMD blurb, the IMDB blurb, which I am going to read out for anyone that is listening and watching that wants to hear it, because I think it sums up nicely without giving anything away in the slightest. A stubborn, unwelcome journalist, played by you, Alice, late night visit to the home <laughs> of a haunted musician, played by you, Linnea, reveals a dark, se- dark secrets and wets deadly appetite. So, as you said, you both stars, Devin and Julia. So, starting with you, Alice, Julia, getting involved in this. So Matthew comes to you and says, I want you for this part. What tempts you? What excites you? What interests you about this role? Um, That her, honestly, the first thing was the spelling of her name. (laughs) I got it wrong as well. I had to correct the review. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's spelled J-U-L-I-Y-A. Um, And I was like, okay, so she's a little alternative. She's a little funky. Um, (laughs) 
And uh, Matthew had sent me pictures of, um, I think just artists renderings um, of a, a goth girl. And he's like, this is kind of the look that I'm envisioning. And I was like, okay, that's fun. That's something I haven't done before. Um, and so I think that, yeah, the, the first the first thing that attracted me was probably Matthew's concept. And then, mm -hmm. and then I read the script and I was like, I like how fast she talks. I like how much she talks. Um, I like the direct motivation that she has. And she clearly knows a lot um, about Devin's career. They've been friends in the past or more like frenemies. So I like that kind of relationship that there's a little bit of concern in there about Devin's well-being, but mostly Julia is trying to save her own journalism career. So yeah, I liked, I liked the dialogue. I liked the, the chemistry between the characters. Yeah. How much of Julia is Alice? Any percentage you could give? <laughs> 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 um uh tenacity perhaps <laughs> okay. just, just going for it <laughs> i like that i like that um dev um devon the character of devon is different uh a different kind of approach for you um because ultimately we have to talk about more with colors almost in conjunction with this um for you Lene, approaching that we're turning to devon what was the what was the appeal to come back and follow this story on? I just Devin as a character, there's just she is very reserved, but there's just a lot to her and there's different layers of, you know, her life and the things that she's been through. And although a lot of that does get exposed in, in morbid colors, there's just this next chapter that I really felt like Matt had something to tell. Uh, once he figured it out and was just like, this is where I'm going, like before I get started, like, do you think there's anything to this? And I just really thought that there was so much to Devin that she she deserves to have more of her story told. Mm. Do you feel though, because uh, I think this is important, because, uh, uh, you know, I'll be completely honest with you, I didn't know about Morbid Colors uh, as an existing thing, as a precursor almost to Real Cool Time. So obviously when I saw it, uh, it was completely standalone for me. And I thought, oh, OK, that's cool. Now what I know. And uh, it still stands on its own. It can be watched in that aspect. And um, considering you've only got 20 odd minutes, 25 ish minutes to portray Devon in this were you conscious of that were you conscious of the fact that it was going to be it needed to be viewed as a standalone as well as in conjunction with morbid colors we definitely went into it um trying to do that like although you know it is a, a continuation of the story we just really wanted to make sure that it was solid on mm. its own with it being a short you know sending it out into the festival circuit we just didn't want it to be another part we needed it to be its own its own thing um Devin's just so reserved usually that as the story went on it just uh I had to take De Devin to a little bit of a different place than what I was used to but uh, mm. um I, I'm just really proud of what we did and uh I think it's going to be great. I want everybody to see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to ask you the same question as well. How much of Devon? How much of Devon is in Linnea? Um, none, honestly, none. <laughs> uh, I like to think I'm, I'm a, you know, at her core, Devon is a very, she's a good person. Uh, she has a lot of love in her. Um, I like to think that I have that, but that's probably the only thing that we have in common. I'm, I'm loud and I can be vulgar and I'm um, very animated <laughs> and uh, I'm just, yeah. as a personality aspect, I'm completely different. I'm probably more like Julia, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so there is an aspect of Real Cool Time that was quite attractive to me is uh, our website and what we do it is probably 60% uh, based around music uh, 30% horror and 10% games, but music is a major part of it from writing reviews to doing a lot of interviewing bands over the years. And uh, obviously interviews vary. And, uh, you know, as a viewer, I cringe at certain times when an interview that takes place in real cool time is as 
hard as it is for Julia. Um, that aspect, <laughs> Alice, and getting into the role of that journalist and having to try to go through the nightmarish experience of one word answers and so on. Did you did you draw any inspiration from a particular area um, in regards to that kind of tenacity, that f- pushing and pushing and pushing to get as many answers as you can? Um, well, um, I think I mentioned that play that I was in prior mm. that saw and maybe maybe that's what <laughs> um decided helped him decide to cast me um i was in a show called puffs which is a parody of harry potter um mm-hmm. unrelated to the the whole estate um but it's told from the perspective of the hufflepuffs and uh, it's really cute behind the scenes i've and, heard of this i yeah, have heard yeah, of this yeah. By Matt Cox, um, and um, one of the the character that I played, Megan Jones, she's kind of this self hating Hufflepuff. She doesn't think she belongs in the Hufflepuffs, so she's a bit of a goth girl, and she thinks she belongs in Slytherin. So I think that character the whole time has this tenacity of I need to prove myself as this badass witch. I don't want to be these these nerds. Um, so maybe maybe that is what I what perhaps I subconsciously drew on um, for this character. This kind of don't mess with me. Um, I I know things, and you can't you can't make me feel for you. I'm going to get my story. So maybe 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 that's what what it was. Yeah. Yeah, it's the character is both likable and incredibly unlikable in equal measures because of that tenacity. It's mm-hmm. it's admirable, but my God, is it. Um, is it hard to watch? <laughs> the curiosity killed the cat, you know? <laughs> um, Lene, um, Devon, this weary musician that we meet uh, in real cool time, you were following on from what you did in Morbid Colours. So you have a short amount of time to portray this and you want to get across this weird musician who's haunted and dealing with bigger, bigger issues, but you're also still uh, a writer, you're still a musician, you're still an artist. What particular things did you go to? Did you have any particular inspirations that you looked at from a potentially music part where you looked at uh, 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 an existing person and thought, okay, that's what I want to draw into the character? Um, Sort of. I try to, when I like a- approach somebody, I try to embody them as much as I can. Um, but I definitely try to find outside inspiration. Um, I thought she was very, um, for some reason, like Kurt Cobain kind of came to my mm. mind when I- think of like a place that Devin could be in you know that that this dark place where she just you know although she's in a sort of semi-successful part of her career she's just also personally in such a a depressive state and you know she feels lost and she feels disconnected from you know her band and I just kind of brought a lot of of uh of him into that and I don't know why I like automatically went to him when um, Mm. I read the script but I just you know that that's kind of probably one of my number one inspiration for um, how Devin was feeling for a uh, real full time. Yeah. Um, elements of that are always sometimes more intense than fast paced action sequence and so on when you can identify and look and go, okay, you can see and read uh, the state of mind of a person, a character, particularly in a short amount of time. So incredible, incredible work there. Thank you. I appreciate that. So the film does obviously get quite intense. We are going to dance around spoilers here to a degree, but I want you to talk to me and start with you, Alice, about the intense moments that do occur in real cool time, particularly how much fun uh, you can draw. Because obviously from a viewer's perspective, it does not look like fun at all. (laughs) So yeah, talk to me about the fun aspect of the more intense moments. I think like what was great about the production is that we had like, um, people who were trained in stunt choreography. So they made sure we were totally safe the entire time that we weren't we weren't doing physical things that we weren't comfortable with and we weren't unsafe. Like the, the props designers did a great job. We weren't using real knives. Mm. <laughs> so, um, so I think that part was fun, like as, as a theater person too, to learn some of this stunt choreography and to do it a little slower and then build up to doing it in um, regular time. And from your perspective, because of course you have a completely different perspective in your role, Lene, what, what about the fun aspect for you? I loved um, the fighting. Um, that mm. was probably one of my favorite things um, was just 
we practiced it a lot. We made sure that we were safe, but once we got into it and how it was shot, it just looked so cool. And it was so fun to make. Um, I mean, Devin kind of just gets the not beat out of her uh, a couple of different times, <laughs> things smashed on her head. Um, but the, the fighting, the fighting was the funnest. I have to ask then, was this, did, did you, did you both know each other before uh, you met on the show, before you were on the show? No, like we, yeah, we uh, met each other a couple weeks prior, like the, the two of us just got together and had dinner and, and talked about how, because we, we'd been familiar with each other's other work, mm -hmm. um, but we had ever met. So, you know, it was just a lot of fun to be like, oh, I'm so excited to meet with you and really excited to know, get to meet each other as people. And then we were going to play these totally different characters. So you did, by the time it came to the more intense uh, sequences, feel like quite comfortable in doing these with each other. I, I felt comfortable. Um, I just you know, you got to put your hands on each other. So I was just very like, I'm going to, I'm going to put my hand on your leg. Is that okay? I'm going to grab your, you know, your <laughs> ankle. Is that okay. Like, I, you know, <laughs> even though we had got to know each other and it was just such a close and intimate environment when we were making it that, you know, we were comfortable with each other, but I just, you know, I try to be respectful of boundaries and I'm just like, I'm going to touch you here. Is that okay? This is what we're going to do. Is that okay? And I mean, it, it was, and it was, it was fun to do. Mm -hmm. that's awesome to hear i'm glad you had such a fun time because it is such an intense sequence of events and it's not even just leading up to an action-packed se sequence uh it's also the stuff that leads into that ultimately um the expressions the attitudes the feeling that you get and the constant feeling of dread that hangs over this movie which is a testament to the script and of course you're both your incredible performances to make a person feel that uncomfortable in a such a short amount of time so, mm -hmm. what's your favorite moment from the movie then? Starting with you, Alice. Um, I think uh, there's a there's a moment. Well, okay, it's the shot with the <laughs> stained glass. Oh, how much am I allowed to say? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the, the funny thing is that um, the film was uh, filmed in my apartment. Like it's it's a pretty old building, like a Victorian building downtown. Okay. So there's some, like creepy architecture. There are mirrors and stained glass windows. So I think one of my one of my favorite sequences is um, the the lighting effects that happen through the stained glass windows. Jake was able mm. to get on like a roof outside, like a the bottom porch roof and put some lighting rigs up so it looked like lightning and so there's there's a scene of us um in the in the living room and i'm just looking through records and the light the lightning is coming through the stained glass windows i really i really like whenever whenever we see something cool like that yeah incredible yeah it is a it is a very very attractive uh attractive look <laughs> how about you elaine um i like the little um little easter eggs that are around the um apartment like if you just if you didn't know to look for them you probably wouldn't see them mm. um some lighting choices kind of help things in the background without giving uh away too many spoilers i guess um the the lighting effects for our little friend that is just hanging out um I, I liked that <laughs> aspect of it it just gave a, a little bit of a creepy element to it um there's uh when Devin's in the living room laying on the couch the leather jacket that's hanging on the back of the couch mm. that's a jacket that I use for morbid colors um the scarf that's hanging on the back of the couch was something I used in morbid colors uh there's a little band photo next um to the couch that we took over the summer um with some really cool guys that are gonna actually help me um tell a little bit more of Devin's story um mm for the future um so that's a cute little easter egg Devin's journal um that you see a couple of different times uh I drew that I, I filled it up I kind of gave it you know a little Devin touch and 
there's a lot of little things like that um, in the background of the movie that just kind of make it a little more uh, personal to me. I'm assuming the rest of the cast too, but that's probably one of my favorite things about it are just the little, I don't want to say inside jokes, but the little insides that uh, someone that doesn't know anything about it wouldn't really notice. But also some rewards, you know, for those that did see Morbid Colours and then have followed the journey as well and come here. It's rewards for that. And, you know, as we talk about it, an urgency and a drive to go see Morbid Colours if by chance you do catch the short. A little bit, a little bit of fan service for, uh, you know, the handful of people that probably saw Morbid Colours. <laughs> So of course, talking to Matthew, we did a uh, uh, we did talk about expansions, and uh, we've mentioned it a few times, and we are going to dance completely and utterly around us without giving anything away um, at all. But uh, I guess I just want your opinions on the fact that you are aware that real good time leave does leave you wanting more. Is that something you're consciously aware of? Yeah, I think we kind of did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's almost nothing else to say there because we don't want to give too much away. But it is a it is an exciting it is an exciting future potentially. Mm -hmm. I think so. I uh, I hope so at least. Mm. Even, and even if everybody's not excited about it, we're excited to tell it. So it'll be there regardless. <laughs> yes, more, blood, uh, more smashing sugar plates. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Alice, what do you see as a challenge or what do you perceive as a challenge to getting Real Cool Times name out there, out into the world? And we know the use of social media can be pushed and utilised in a positive way, but worldwide it can still be incredibly difficult to get your voice heard. As um, you build towards film festivals and submissions and aspects like that, that's great. But for say, for example, here in the UK, what do you perceive as the biggest challenge to kind of getting the name out there? Um, I guess I've never tried to do publicity for mm. for a film before. Um, so just watching Matt and Lene kind of kind of take the lead on it, um, I guess maybe some of the challenges um, would be that you know we, we live in Evansville, Indiana, which is kind of a, a small city, you might say. Um, mm. So we don't get as much exposure here, but we do have our sets, our eyes set on film festivals in Chicago, in in Louisville. Um, so, so I think the challenge might just be to, um, think a little outside of our, of our bubble. Yeah. And, and it's caught your eye. So that's, that's, that's really impressive that the, the publicity team has gotten there already. Absolutely. Well, but, uh, Linnea, could you expand on that? Um, it is really, it's really challenging. I mean, uh, social media is a, uh, a fickle mistress and you hmm. definitely have to, uh, treat her right to get on uh you know her good side and it, sometimes word of mouth helps you uh you just kind of got to do you know the legwork and put time into it and upload new content and you know just follow back anybody else that gives you a follow try to find things that are similar to follow them to get you know the right people's attention um our instagram's not thriving but it is definitely not dead um mm. i try to post stuff weekly um i share it on my personal account as well a lot of the people in the cast try to share as much as we can on our personal accounts and we're just hoping that you know it'll get some traction and maybe maybe it'll uh it'll blow up one day and that'll help us get the word out but you know we're just we're doing our best <laughs> trying to get get out what we can to those who are interested well, that's all you can do, and you describe social media in the most perfect way possible. Fickle <laughs> mistress, which um, I asked Matthew this question, and I want to ask you both it too as well. For those who do want to support, not just real cool time, but you as individuals in your own projects and lives in what you're doing, starting with you, Alice, how can how can people help support you, be it uh, uh, financially or be it just promoting your stuff? Um, I think. Uh, yeah, my my personal social media, I feel like um, if you want to follow, follow all of us, um, my handle is Alice underscore in underscore Punderland. So <laughs> if anybody wants to follow that. Um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of things that I try to do for myself, you know, I I look for submission opportunities. 
Um, I try to keep in contact with, you know, the, the network, the networking connections that I've made. Um, so yeah, it's all kind of, it's all kind of a hustle. Um, and I also have a full-time job as a, as a college English instructor. So there's, I can't move around as much as I would like. Um, but that would be, that would be cool in the future if I could relocate to, um, a bigger, a bigger metropolis where, um, opportunities might be a little more plentiful. No, I completely understand real life ultimately is uh it's always going to be a dominant feature the it's going to be a time sink it's what we all have to do unfortunately um or fortunately depending upon if you really love your job um <laughs> Linnea, how about you uh the promotion what can people do to help promote not just real cool time but you as an individual um gosh i guess you know if you go back to the social media aspect of it mm-hmm. just word of mouth um share a post give a follow, you know, things like that would, I think, help get us pointed in the right direction, kind of get the word out a little bit better. Um, I mean, I, I'm not above uh, starting a, a Venmo to get, uh, you know, mm. help, help getting into the festival circuit and paying for those fees and stuff like that. I mean, I, I definitely don't want to do that. I don't know how many people would be interested in doing that now, but uh, the easiest way to just help is, you know, word of mouth and share 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 tell everybody about it this thing's cool look at it you know (laughs) yeah it's 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 it is still so so important the word of mouth that exists online as much as anything else um particularly uh outside of the america america into places like the uk and so on you talked to matthew about um we don't have the glut of film festivals that perhaps the US is very does. We have a couple of large ones. One that takes place in August in London, the capital called Fright Fest. Have you ever heard of that? And I'd love to, I feel like Real Cool Time would fit that so perfectly. I almost want to find a way to get it there. I just don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got one more for you then. And really it's some self-promotion and starting with you, Alice. What is going on? What else is going on with you right now that you would uh, like to push? Mm. <laughs> um, well, I'm a playwright too, and one of my uh, full-length works is being produced um, at a regional theater in New York, Naples, New York, this summer. Um, it's called Bristol Valley Theater, and it's running J- July 6th through 15th, and the play is called Magical Thinking. So it's a, kind of a family drama, a little sad, but funny too. <laughs> incredible, incredible. Yeah. Have you, Lene? Um, I'm definitely way less interesting. Um, this is basically, um, besides my normal, you know, nine to five job, this is the only thing I really have going on right now is, um, real cool time. So everybody watch it, please, when it comes out. (laughs) That's it. That's it. Normally I get to do these and talk as though I can push people in a direction and be like, cool, here it is. Go see there and so on. But we're not quite at that stage yet. But when we are, I will do my best to scream it from the houses because it is an incredible watch. We, I, I watch, we watch a lot of horror shorts, varying lengths. Um, uh, pretty much one every week goes up on the website. So anything that stands out, it really, really does stand out from the pack. A real cool time. It's an incredibly well-made horror short, but also an incredibly well acted from you both horror short. I can't praise you enough for what you've managed to achieve here. Enough so that Morbid Colours is now, well, basically I'm going to finish this and I'm going to spend the next two hours watching that movie because <laughs> I didn't know about it. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It has been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked what you saw, please help us out by giving us a thumbs up and hitting that subscribe button. If you really liked what you saw, consider donating to keep the website and channel running by buying us a coffee via our coffee page or picking up some merch from our big cartel store. You can check us out on gbhbell.com as well as via our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as listen to our interviews via SoundCloud, Apple Music, and Spotify. Just search for GBHBL games, horror, and heavy metal. What else is life for?